All right, great. Um, we're going to reconvene our meeting and switch gears to uh, S5, is the Affordable Heat Act, and amendments, the first three of which were presented to us yesterday afternoon. So we're going to have a discussion and we're going to start by taking up the appropriations amendment and ask, uh, do members have discussions, questions, things they want to bring up on this? This is the amendment that would put a cap of 15 on the technical advisory group membership number. And for obvious reasons, the appropriations committee is interested in knowing how much that will cost and to cap to cap it for that reason. Representative Bongart. I move to find the appropriations committee. committee. All right, so we're gonna probably just do straw votes on them, right? It is. <clears throat> well, yeah, so with amendments, we don't actually have them, I guess. They're out there in the ether. It's not a bill on our wall. So we typically do a straw poll on them, but I do appreciate getting us started. And um, so is there is there further discussion on this amendment before we vote on it? Yeah, just, Representative Clifford. Dang, I just, I didn't hear what. Uh, well, he moved that we find it favorable, but we're gonna have oh, to do okay. a straw poll. That's okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I think um, I think this is. I think we should find this favorable. I think the PUC um, has weighed in. Uh, we've heard from them, or I've heard from them, that this is um, this works with kind of the standard practice of these groups. So I think this is pretty easy. Okay, great. So, um, all those in favor of the appropriations committee amendment, raise your hand. So that is ten. Zero one in favor of the appropriations amendment. And next up is the James Amendment. Um, and that is the amendment that in four instances includes manufactured home, essentially, then also has as a fifth instance of amendment which I need reminding. Uh, this is um, uh, doubling down on the check back and uh, putting the, the first set of obligations on the fuel sellers into the rules that we have to vote on in order to mm -hmm. enact the clean heat standard in 2020. So there can be no obligation put on the fuel dealers uh, unless we specifically act to do that. Um, there was some concern that the PUC might be able to obligate the fuel sellers to order. This specifically makes that impossible. Has to be by rule. Clarify that, that, that we vote on. Yes. Is there discussion on this amendment, Representative Tory? Just a question about that, just to confirm. So the PUC in their rules will know the amount for that first year? Yes. I thought that we had allowed the PUC to issue some orders in order to gather the have. Okay, so what's the, just to make sure yeah. we're not undermining that. So that was a change that we made from what came over from the Senate at the PUC's request, because they may need to utilize an order process in order to, for instance, establish the DDA and or the registration uh, those types of things. They requested that they be able to do that. There was some concern out there that that provided a workaround uh, for implementing the program without legislative approvals. And so this clearly says that you cannot obligate the fuel sellers without the rules being passed because their obligation will be in the first set of rules. So if you can't obligate the fuel sellers, the program doesn't go but they can still issue orders. They can, for yes. Setup. Other yeah. orders, yes. yes. That, yes. Okay. They needed that's that flexibility. Yep. And yep. This that's keeps the I, program from okay. going Good. without our authorization. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Further questions on this amendment? Um, uh, yes. This is the, the uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the, the second amendment we received uh, talks about Highest energy burdens. Yes. In manufacturing. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, any further discussion? Right. Um, all those who are just doing another straw poll, but so we're gonna raise our hands. Um, all those who uh, are in favor of this amendment, please raise your hand. Okay, I'm seeing nine. All those opposed? Oh, eight. Sorry, eight to, to two. Eight, two, and one absent. Okay. And then in the third instance of amendment is the Harrison Amendment. And I don't have a printed copy. So would you remind us what that one is? Yes. So this moves into the first circuit breaker that we have in the bill that would allow the PUC to temporarily pause um, <clears throat> the you know, requirements for good cause. Arguably, good cause uh, is could also be the price of um, so this takes the existing circuit breaker and adds to one of the causes uh, that uh, if the average price of heating fuel in Vermont increases to more than 20 cents above the average fuel price in New England, uh, that is a listed potential. Um, undo adverse financial that could be considered. And the commission would determine how long that average Vermont fuel price needs to be increased before taking action. So, <clears throat> okay. so um, I think a couple of things. First of all, we've the, the flexibility for the PUC to address uh, rising prices is already in the bill. Um, secondly, uh, we have data. Um, about a number of times in the last uh, decade, that uh, Vermont fuel prices have been significantly more than 20 cents higher or lower than other New England states. Um, it's really a testament to the volatility that is in the existing market. Um, and so I think this unnecessarily ties us to, uh, in advance of a whole bunch of information we're going to receive from the PUC through the, P, uh, the potential study um, in 2025. So I would not recommend um, that we do this. I think it, uh, I think it unnecessarily ties our hands uh, in advance of a lot more information that we will be getting in January 2020. Is there further discussion, Representative Tory? Just a question. He was, uh, Representative Harris, Harrison was, Referencing delivered fuels, right? It was delivered fuels, not Vermont gas. You know, heating fuel. I believe it wasn't average price. Uh, undue adverse financial impacts on particular customers or demographic segments, or if the average price of heating fuel in Vermont increases to more than twenty cents above the average fuel price in. Vermont. Well, I think that might have been his intent, but it was another part of. That was not clear. Right. Yeah. Representative Stevens. I, building off of what you just said, um, in terms of the lack of clarity, I I do have concerns with how this is drafted and what it looks like. And I so just in terms of how it would work, I have concerns with that. Um, but I also just generally. Um, you know, we heard testimony from a variety of witnesses that said, uh, you know, please give us some flexibility to, to figure this out. Um, and the whole thing comes back to us in January 2025. And I'd really like to hear what people who work and live in this field and then also the equity advisor group, where they land um, and actually give them the opportunity to talk through that and then we can add 20 cents cap then in January 2025. That's where the group decides it makes sense to go. Yeah. yeah. The checkbook is there. Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, so the straw poll on this, all those who, oh, do you have a comment? Yeah. Yes, I do, please. Thank you. Uh, I think this amendment shows every Vermonter that, that's going to be paying something for something. Uh, it shows good cause 
from the legislature to look out for their best interests. Further, yes, yep. Representative Sebelia, uh, just a reminder for all of us um, that passage of this vote um, will in no way raise costs, raise um, raise uh, fuel prices because we are asking for information to come back to us in January 2025. At that point, the fuel dealers will have decisions to make about what and how much uh, costs they may or may not want to pass on to customers um, if, in fact, we decide to implement this in 2020. So I think we'll have a lot more information in 2025 than we do right now. And again, this may not actually be in Vermonters' best interests. It may tie us in in a way that's not helpful to Vermonters. So could this, this could change if we voted yes for this amendment. In 2025, the recommendations can change it. And it could also come in 2025. So that's good then. I would say not until we have more information. Right. It's not. Right. right. Um, <clears throat> all those in favor of the Harrison Amendment, please raise your hands. Okay. I'm seeing three in favor. Uh, all those opposed, please raise your hands. Okay. Seven and one absent. All right, great. Thank you all for that work on the amendments. Like I said, we'll have one more amendment at 11.45. And with that, we have uh, our next witness here. We can shift back to talking about housing and S100 and welcome Mayor Weinberger. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with all this morning. It's um, the first time I've ever testified in front of this committee, and certainly in, in this room, I remember this uh, before was when we would have uh, lunches here. It's uh, nice to see you in your new digs here. Um, I'm going to hand out um, a couple of documents that I'll reference in, in the testimony. Um, first is a technical memo that was written by uh, the planning staff from uh, Burlington, South Burlington, and Winooski. And um, the second document is a actual um, language we're, we're hoping you will consider that will would implement what's laid out in the in the technical document. Um, let me. I, I will start. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm going to speak specifically to what we're passing around, but before doing that, I do just want to kind of take a step back, speak to uh, what I see is, is the real need here that we're experiencing in Burlington for more housing and how the bill before you relates to that. Um, I'm going to speak to what we feel in Burlington at this point is the single biggest regulatory barrier to new housing being created which uh, we, we refer to as the kind of duplicative uh, redundant review between local zoning and Act 250 um, on, the, uh, on most projects that go through Burlington. Um, and that's when I'll get into the, the solution that we proposed, which is already in the bill in, in a way, but we think it's problematic how it's currently in the bill. And then um, I would like to also to speak to something I know uh, the, the 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 trigger a ten unit tr trigger issue that um, I've seen the letter from the rural caucus in which uh, it, I have some uh, so this is not just a rural issue there's some direct impacts to that trigger on Burlington as well so uh, starting with the need. Um, I've long considered the lack of housing one of the biggest single social challenges that we we face. Um, I hear that from my constituents almost doesn't matter who I'm talking to, whether it's young families struggling to um, be able to purchase a first home. And I've seen the, the jump, housing prices jump dramatically, whether it's businesses who consistently tell me the lack of housing for their employees is their single biggest constraint on uh, growth and expansion. Uh, or the advocates for the homeless who um, who uh, know that while homelessness is a complicated issue, the communities that have the lowest vacancy rates have the highest homelessness rates, and that's and that's what we are experiencing in Burlington. Um, this is a statewide issue. Um, uh, 
the lack of housing statewide estimated by DHFA to be a shortage of 40,000 units, a uh, staggering figure um, means that we have the 49th lowest vacancy rate in the country at 2.4% and the second highest homelessness rate in the country, which I think is just shocks for modern sensibilities. Um, and we've seen this uh, since um, <clears throat> just in the, the since 2019, uh, the median home price statewide has jumped more than 35%. Um, in Burlington, all those issues are even more intense and, and, and worse. We, we have, um, we estimated last summer, we had a lot of people out counting. Uh, we have about 70 people sleeping outside um, every night. Many of them have continued to sleep outside uh, even during the, the, the colder months of the year. We, the county in the last couple of years has hit a 20 year vacancy low of 0.4%. And more than half of the renters in Burlington are paying um, more than a third of their income in housing. We have a lot of renters, a primarily renter community in Burlington. <clears throat> um, the, um, in the 11 years I've been doing this, I'm very grateful for the shift that we, there has been in the understanding this issue and coming to understand, I think there's a consensus now that the lack of supply of homes is, is what is, is driving this problem. And I also think there's an emerging consensus uh, locally and nationally that state and local um, laws uh, play a significant role in that. It's, I certainly would acknowledge it's not the only thing that makes it hard to build in Vermont. It's not the only thing driving scarcity and, and cost but it is something that we can control and it is something that is quite significant. And certainly Burlington has really taken that perspective for the last 11 years. We have made numerous reforms to our, our zoning ordinance, everything from we no longer require any amount of parking to be built anywhere in Burlington. We leave that up to builders and to, to determine. We have totally changed our downtown zoning to make it much more streamlined and predictable, what the process is for getting a permit. <clears throat> um, and um, more, and we have three major efforts that are underway in 2023 uh, that would uh, that are our most ambitious rezoning efforts in some ways. And one of them is very consistent with the S100 bill in front of you and that we call it the neighborhood code. It's a code that really, as I understand S100, seeks to do a very similar thing of reverse the uh, problematic regulations locally that were put in place in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s that prohibited it, older forms of housing that were quite popular and played a real role in Burlington until those laws, until those rules went into a case. We used to have a lot of duplexes and triplexes and quads and backyard cottages. And we hope to again, once the neighborhood code is passed. The reason I'm here though, is we can't, uh, we now believe that the biggest single regulatory barrier to more housing being created in Burlington is that uh, redundant review issue. Um, and furthermore, something I think has not gotten nearly enough attention as S100 has been working its way through the process to this point, there is an internal contradiction in the bill uh, where um, the bill makes these new requirements of municipalities that I support. I, I think it is good to require all municipalities to build, have allow a density of at least five units per acre if you're on a municipal water and to raise the height limit and to limit parking requirements. All those things are rules that I support. Um, if, however, this bill is passed without any adjustment of the Act 250 trigger of 10 units, uh, that is going to be a uh, contradiction within the bill that is going to dramatically limit the impact that this ambitious bill is going to have, certainly in Burlington, but I think everywhere in the state. And I'll get into that a little bit more. So first on the redundant <coughs> um, review, <coughs> I don't believe any other state in the country has a situation like, Burlington, like Vermont has where um, projects need to go through both a comprehensive land use review in many cities like Burlington, a development review board process, and then go through a rigorous state review process as well. <clears throat> um, the fact that we are set up that way um, is uh, ha has a really unintended effect, I think, cuts against the very central goal of Act 250 of limiting the erosion of our natural resources in that, in a very real way, it is harder to build projects in the areas we most want them 
um, than it is to build out in suburban and exurban locations because you have to go through that gauntlet of both a local and a state review. Um, I say this with some direct experience. I was a builder. Most, almost everything I built was permanently affordable housing. Um, and I had the experience of, of trying to take projects, of not just trying, we built hundreds of homes in Vermont, New Hampshire, um, previous jobs, I uh, built homes in New York and, and Florida. Um, the, um, the, that redundancy, I hear a lot of hesitancy to take any action to change Act 250 this year, because I know you have some studies that are not expected to come in until uh, you know, next session. This is an issue that has already been studied by the legislature repeatedly, this redundant review issue. And I do want to quote for you a 2019 Vermont Commission on Act 250 report that was, I believe, transmitted to this committee years back that, um, that looked specifically at the small number of projects that do get Act 250 exemptions under our current, the current uh, designated area. Um, <clears throat> Uh, affordable housing uh, exceptions. And what that found was very positive. It found that um, uh, those exempt projects uh, supported the development of 586 homes, saved an average, an average of $50,000 per project in permit fees, and reduced permit timelines an estimated average, average of seven months. And I do emphasize the average point and that means that many projects uh, took considerably longer than the seven months and that $50,000. And I've always thought it was a little unfortunate that that study, while very helpful, I think, putting this information out there, it uh, uh, neglects what I found as a builder to be the most expensive part of a redundant uh, permitting process, which is the hundreds of thousands of dollars in professional fees that are necessary to spend at every level, defending every discretionary permit. So a builder has to pay a architect and a uh, civil engineer. And in many cases, because of um, our ambitious energy codes, we have to bring mechanical, uh, I say we, I'm no longer a builder, but, but someone who is building needs to bring uh, mechanical engineers forward. They need to bring traffic engineers in most cases. Often the parking is contested. They need to bring environmental engineers who have studied the uh, the, the history of the project. And then they need to do that again um, uh, and respond to questions and, and a process that can take weeks or months um, at, the, at the next level. That is a pro process that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, what neither the study nor what I just laid out can ever fully count is what I believe to be a, is the most important issue, which is that many builders just choose not to go through that gauntlet, should go through that process. Uh, that there's no way to quantify or no clear way to quantify um, how many projects just never are even attempted because of that re uh, redundant level of review and either are pursued out in areas where there isn't a consensus that we want um, so much housing out beyond the local zoning areas or just never happen at all and contribute to the lack of uh, the, this, this lack of supply. We've been making the case since this this bill um, has been going through the process that that something be done about this. Um, and I do appreciate that the Senate made a late attempt at the first committee um, to address this. And they have actually, if you go to section 19 of the bill, there is uh, a new concept introduced there called enhanced designation that would, um, attempt to give municipalities some recourse for uh, avoiding, for, for, to address this redundant review. Um, and again, I welcome that there's an attempt there. I do think there are two pretty substantial problems with the way the Burke bill currently does this. One, this would continue to apply to only designated areas. You would take the designated areas and then you would be able to enhance that designation. <laughs> As other people have pointed out, that means this would apply to just 0.3% of all of Vermont, even within Burlington, which has the most designated areas of any municipality. We have two, we have a, we have a downtown designated downtown, and we have a neighborhood development area, the first community to get a neighborhood development area. That only covers about 14% of the total 
city area is within the, the de, within the designated area. And it's very hard. Maybe there would be a route through a lot of work to expand it, but my experience with the state boards that govern these designated areas is that they see their mission is to keep these areas pretty tight and confined. So um, uh, the majority of Burlington and certainly the majority of the areas where we're trying to build housing in Burlington would not be in this enhanced designated area. The other problem with this, which is I think a big problem if you're trying to respond to a crisis and emergency is that this would put, what this would say is that the NRB, an agency that, that <clears throat> has limited resources, it would be tasked with going out and writing a um, model bylaws that municipalities that wanted this um, Act 250, this enhanced designation would need to adopt. Um, the problem, that, that's a lot of work for, for the NRB and it's work that's probably gonna take years and it's really not work that's necessary. And what we have proposed as an alternative and it is the kind of option one municipal delegation route instead of putting the burden on the NRB, would actually put the burden on the municipalities to come forward and go to the NRB still. I'm hoping that is appealing to this committee and to this building. I believe there's confidence that the NRB uh, has Act 250s. You know, is, is it, I, I just, my sense is from the Burlington that there's confidence in, in the NRB. We would still, that, they would still be the key agency. Municipalities would, go to them and initiate a collaborative conversation between uh, regulatory bodies to try to um, establish whether the local zoning was or was not the functional equivalent of Act 250. We believe in Burlington that already, even before starting such a conversation, we regulate 90 to 95% of what the district commissions regulate, what active vision regulates. And in many cases, within that 90, 95%, you actually have to work a whole lot more to do it. It's much more, uh, the, the, lo the local process is just more rigorous and more uh, quantitative. The require requirements are clearer. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 there's, there's a lot of robustness to, to that local regulation. Um, that's our judgment of it. The NRB though would have the power, they would have the authority to say, well, actually we think you gotta do, you gotta change 20% of your zoning. We don't, you know, we don't know exactly how this uh, would, would unfold, um, but this is not an, un there is precedent for this. And I think this is a really important, I've been thinking about this since you hear uh, in the legislature passed, I think it was in 2016 or 2017, the new Lakeshore protection um, regulation, uh, shoreline, shoreline protection regulation. That when it was passed had a municipal delegation um, element to it that cities, Burlington, and I believe a number of other cities have taken advantage of. And we have gone and had these kind of conversations in that case is with the DEC. We did have to make some changes to the way Burlington was regulating shorelines. Once we did that, this authority was delegated to us and um, there was no need to go through these two layers of review for those permits. That's what we're envisioning here. Um, I do just want to po point out, and this wasn't clear when we were on the Senate side there. Uh, I have talked to Sabina Haskell, the chair of the NRB, and she is supportive of this, uh, this municipal delegation concept. And, and uh, I know you're going to hear from her tomorrow. And um, it seems important to me that there is support at that regulatory level. And I think, I think it is accurate to say she is more supportive of that than the alternative that is currently in the bill. Because it, again, because I think it really puts um, problematic demands uh, on them. And again, demands that there's no reason for them to go out and write a model bylaw when municipalities have spent decades writing these bylaws already and they, they already largely accomplish what a, a model bylaw would do. That's my point. So that's municipal delegation. Uh, Quickly now moving over to the trigger issue um, here. The point I want to make here is I referenced at the beginning, this idea of Burlington is trying to pass a neighborhood code. This neighborhood code would, um, would re-legalize these smaller scale residential structures. Uh, we are envisioning, uh, you know, uh, and we haven't done this yet, uh, but we're, 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 we've been working for years on this with AARP and, um, which is at a national level trying to work on this. And we have published kind of models of how this could work. Very appealing for, we envision like there'd be 
done some and will provide some written backup on this that shows some images of this. We see like there, there's a, a number of one acre plots in the new North end that currently have one house on them. And you could only build, you could build one more ADU on it legally. Currently uh, we're envisioning um, a backyard cottage zoning that would allow um, six, uh, six homes to be built on, on that same area, these small cottages. And we think you can do that dramatically increase the amount of housing opportunities without eroding in a problematic way, the character of these desirable beloved neighborhoods. If there's no change to the trigger, um, I think we will see very, even if we go through the pain and it will be painful, there's going to be controversy around Burlington passing this neighborhood code. And, and I hope there's an awareness that if you pass what's in West S100, you are putting political pain on local officials statewide. It is not going to be popular with all of their constituents to go out and take areas that are one acre zoning and say, you now have to allow five units on, on that, on that acre. Uh, you, you now have to allow an additional floor of height. There's going to be a lot at, at, you know, as local official, we're going to, you're going to have a lot of active public forums with people coming out and uh, being unhappy about that. And, but it's worth doing. I support it. If, if, if though, only if it, those homes then get built, what I'm very concerned about is that if there's no change to the trigger, um, very few of those homes will actually get built. Uh, let me give you a few examples. If you had a property owner that owned four acres in a one acre zoning town, currently only allowed to build four units on there, the, the thrust of your bill is that they would have to allow 20 units to be built. The local zoning would need to be upzoned to allow 20 units to be built on those four acres. If there isn't a change to the trigger, it's that it, what is going to happen in that situation at best probably is that nine homes will be built on those four acres because so that the builder can avoid, can stay under the trigger and avoid Act 250. Even worse, the way the trigger functions <clears throat> that it applies to the builders um, means that if we succeed at passing this neighborhood code and we one of these one acre backyard cottage developments could happen before the Act 250 was triggered. But as soon as that builder choice to go and build another one of these backyard cottage uh, neighborhoods, they will be over the 10 units. And, you know, I think you've seen testimony at other committees that, that, it, that double that going, it is a very powerful incentive so much so that builders, they, they will, they will, they will not pursue those projects because of that uh, additional layer of review. Instead, they'll go five miles down the road and look for a project that way. I think that's a big problem. The way we want builders that specialize in, in building these types of small scale homes, this is an, un, this trigger is an unnecessary barrier to them actually pursuing that. And I think it's really going to hold back on the efficacy of this, of this legislation. Um, if it, if it passes and it could be addressed uh, partially addressed, somewhat addressed through raising the trigger to 25. I think this concept in the law in the rural uh, uh, committees um, uh, language just to exempt from the trigger these uh, buildings up to four units is a is a great, very simple idea that would also um, avoid uh, both in the Burlington neighborhood code context as well as this, the, around the state um, that that trigger problem. So I hope you'll seriously consider that. Thank you for allowing me to talk for an extended time. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions if you, uh, if you have them. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Representative Pat. Uh, just on the redundancy issue, how much of the issue is the uh, simply the the additional time, effort, and money that you that you uh, that it, that that costs, and how much are there uh, conflicting outcomes out of those processes? I'm well? really thank you very much for that question because one of the in your in the technical memo you'll yeah. see a point that has made it, and I think this is a powerful point. There aren't conflicting outcomes um, in the, the technical memo written for you. Uh, has was again a, a joint venture between Burlington, South Burlington, and Winooski. And it was really, it was not the politicians, it was the planning staff that got together to do this and at the request of the committee. And um, one of the statements they make is none of the, the staffs from either of these committees could remember a time in the last five to 10 years when there had been any significant 
uh, rejection or modification of what had been permitted at the local level. It's, it's, yeah, I think that's a really important point. It's not that you, there's not a lot of additional, the additional public value gain from that, that very costly additional review is, is very hard to identify if it exists at all. Any other questions? <clears throat> thank you for joining us and for your testimony. <clears throat> okay, thank you. I really appreciate you putting um, this focus on this bill and uh, I will follow up with the additional document I mentioned. And if there's additional follow-up that would be helpful for me <clears throat> or the planning staff that really authored what's there, we'd of course be happy to be collaborative on that for us. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> oh. There, there was a second document going around. I don't know. Uh, sorry, there was a, there were two. Yes, he brought two with him. And I don't know. If it was. And um, I think maybe we missed. And also, did you receive the red line? Uh, we received this one. Okay, this is the suggested language yeah, okay. as an amendment. That's the one. And that, can we we submit those electronically. I will. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. and okay. we'll have a written. Um, summary of the verbal testimony he gave as well. The best Great, thank, thank you. you Great, uh, Representative Higley, please join us. And folks, we're going to shift gears back to S five, and Representative Higley has an amendment to present to us. <coughs> Welcome. Well, thank you, folks. Uh, Representative Mark Higley from the Orleans Memorial District. Uh, yeah, get her talked about my amendment. To the, on page 1954 of today's calendar. Um, it's really pretty much a one-liner. Uh, just to give you a little background, uh, I served on energy and technology with uh, the Vice Chair and Bavram uh, back when we uh, passed the Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, personally, at that time, I felt that uh, the provision that was included in there that I'm trying to remove now, which is the um, provision around uh, cause of action where any person can sue if we don't meet our benchmarks. Uh, and personally, uh, I thought that was unnecessary um, at the time, and I think it's even more unnecessary now. Uh, the reason I thought it was unnecessary at the time was we had testimony from the Conservation Law and Foundation that sued Massachusetts over their Global Warming Solutions Act, and they didn't have a provision in their Global Warming Solutions Act like we do here. Um, I think, <clears throat> Um, even in the Climate Council's 2023 report in January, it's only a 14-page report, so if you have a chance to read it, please do. Uh, they say that we are not going to meet our benchmarks. Um, so that, for me, is a concern as well. Um, the reason, part of the reason, I believe, would be that since we passed the Global Warming Solutions Act, we've gone through two years of a pandemic. Uh, there's a war that's created inflationary issues all over the country, whether it's through <clears throat> gasoline, food prices, you name it. Um, there's supply chain issues, there's workforce issues. Um, all these things play into that. <clears throat> and I'll go back to my disapproval of the Global Warming Solutions Act in general, but in particular this provision, <clears throat> to lock ourselves into this and and having a provision that if these outfits or persons, whoever it is, can sue, and if they prevail, we're also going to pay for their attorney fees and reasonable costs is unreasonable. Especially when, as I've just said, in the past number of years, we're in a position now that's, that's hampering us in what people can afford out there in, in our communities. Um, so, again, I, there's no reason for this clause in the Global Warming Solutions Act to be in there because they can do it anyway. They have done it, and I, they will do it and, it, and it will happen, in my opinion. Um, but to, again, put us into this position where uh, we're, <laughs> we're basically encouraging them to do it. I understand the intent of it initially was, oh, it's going to keep our feet to the fire. But again, I'll go back to what's happened since we passed the Global Warming Solutions Act. And there's things that change all the time, and who knows how it's going to change down the road. So, you know, that's my spiel, and uh, I'm sticking to it. 
Thank you. Um, Representative Cedilia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this, <clears throat> first, I think we need to know that citizens can sue um, at any time for, um, to have the law upheld. In fact, um, I sent the Secretary of Education a letter um, saying, uh, if you do not uphold this law that was passed, we are going to pursue suing um, in 2017. So that is something that citizens can do. And uh, here is what this bill does um, <clears throat> to make that uh, uh, much more tailored in the Global Warming Solutions Act. So the court in that kind of a case has to decide, well, what do we do here? What's the remedy? Uh, with the Global Warming Solutions Act, the cause of action actually serves to really uh, limit what can happen um, in terms of enforcement. Uh, Representative Higley spoke about what happened in Massachusetts with the Global Warming Solutions Act and uh, the Conservation Law Foundation suit. And it was hard for the court to figure out, what do we do here? Uh, what is it that we, what is required of us? How do we make this right? In um, Title 10, Section 594, we actually have been very specific about um, what is required. And so what's required is the Secretary of um, Natural Resources needs to bring forward a plan. Um, and if she doesn't, she has to be notified by an entity that uh, with 60 days notice um, that we're missing the plan, we're intending to sue, so that she has two months to rectify that. Um, it has to be within, um, it has to be within, no, the second one has to be within. So if she's put forward the plan, there's nothing to be done. It's the plan. The second is you have to make progress. Um, and so uh, this is within one year of the Vermont Greenhouse Gas Commission's inventory, inventory and forecast. Um, we're looking at within one year of the goals that are in statute. So we have 2025, 2030, 2050, uh, and we failed to meet it. Within one year of that, uh, someone may bring a suit and say, you, you didn't meet the emissions targets. And this says, okay, well, here's the remedy for that. Here's what the court will tell you is the remedy for that. They should look to see if the plan that was passed was adequate um, for making progress. Um, if there's if not adequate, uh, reasonable, I think is the word, for making progress. And if it's not, they need to go back and adopt another plan. Um, and uh, it also notes that if the court finds that the secretary is taking prompt and effective action to comply, the court may grant the secretary a reasonable period of time to do so. So uh, the onus on meeting the, the goals that are in the Global Warming Solutions Act, the emissions reduction goals, is on the Secretary of Natural Resources. And so <clears throat> this says, if, we're, if uh, the plans that are out there uh, are, if she's taking prompt and effective action to comply, then they may grant the, her a reasonable period of time to continue to do so. So this actually is something that narrows legal action against the state as opposed to um, increases exposure. So the inclusion of this um, was helpful to the state, not inviting a lawsuit, but uh, being very articulate about what a lawsuit could be. So I recommend we don't pass this. Getting the sense that Representative Higley would like to respond. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the outcome would be any different. I mean, it talks about in here that the, the actions we brought that Superior Court, that's what happened in Massachusetts as well. And then they took it onto the Supreme Court and won. Um, it's a lengthy process. Uh, I believe that process took about four years. Um, the um, um, concern as well is um, I think that the courts are going to have more latitude than what you're saying there as far as what uh, may be required of the state. And that was one of our concerns initially, uh, a number of us in regards to, uh, you know, the whole global warming, the whole climate council being out of the hands of a um, elected body uh, was, was one concern. But then if this provision was ever uh, acted upon, you'd have the courts that are gonna make the decisions then. And, and again, that's another 
body, which is outside the, you know, the, the uh, your constituents uh, um, purview in a sense, or how, how to act. So anyway, I, I and, and I also, you know, it may, it may seem tailored, but I know in uh, um, actions, lawsuits, uh, there, there, there can be more. They can, you know, um, advocate for more than just the narrow, so-called narrow um, wording in this, in this clause. All right, thank you for presenting your amendment to us. Thank you. And hopefully I can commit some time and uh, just give a brief report on repealing H74 altogether. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there, is there further discussion on this? I am actually going, looking up this section of statute myself online. Just to, uh, go ahead, Representative Smith. But do we know if there are, are there are there any other bills that either you know passed or present right now that <clears throat> have a stipulation in them that says you, they can sue the state? I don't know. Curious. Yeah, and I guess I, I would add, as I recall, this was a narrowing and I was making it more specific and clarification in order to address some of the same concerns that came up without this section of statute being added to the bill. So, um, yeah, Representative Bob. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> I think uh, Representative Williams. Parts are correct. It's actually, ironically, this gets viewed as mm -hmm. allowing people to sue, to sue anyway. What it actually does yeah. is narrow okay. and, and make clear what the remedies are. And I think it also really sets up a process in that, in that situation mm -hmm. that is very favorable to really the, the state or all of us, right? because the real goal is remedy. Not just um, you know yeah. uh, something punitive or whatever. So I think it's I think it would be a huge mistake to do that. You think that suggesting that a lawsuit could be made uh, is encouraging people? So oh, if they're not going to meet their goal, well, let's sue them. Yeah, I think because this whole state, everybody's gotten very too crazy in the last I think bunch of years. Statutes imply that right out. Further discussion on this amendment? I'm not seeing any. Once again, oh, go ahead, Representative Sibelius. Yeah, I, I, well, just reminding ourselves that there are three branches of government, legal, judicial, executive. So, uh, you know, we are being really clear in this piece of statute with the court, here's what we meant, um, which is really mm -hmm. helpful when we're you know, when they're trying to provide oversight and a check on us. So, and a lot of times that's not included as, as Representative Bongarts was saying. It's ironically kind of does the opposite of what folks think so it does. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, we are going to do a straw poll on this. And I'm gonna ask uh, folks who find this amendment favorable to raise your hands. See two uh, folks who members who find this unfavorable. Eight and one absent. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Be careful. All right, so that is uh, unfavorable on the eight to one vote. <clears throat> Thank you, members. We did a lot this morning <laughs> on different topics, and we'll be on the floor um, at one, and we are not scheduled to come back to the